varying international relations, war, politics, security, economic and energy issues. So together with Irina Lagunina will be on the panel which is focused on human rights NGOs under the state repression will sit Pavel Demesh, Rasul Jafarov, Alexander Vierchovsky, Tamara Matskiewicz and Adam Bognar. So thank you that you came and finally we can start it. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We, it's already afternoon. We are running a little late. I think we can start. And let me start with saying how honored I am to uh, moderate this distinguished panel on uh, human society and repressions that government execute against uh, the civic society uh, in a lot of countries, including European countries. Uh, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, or Radio Liberty, or Radio Svoboda, as it's known in Russia, has always been a supporter of not only democrat democratic tr transitions in the countries uh, and not only of free thinking, but we also considered ourselves as the supporters of the civic society uh, in the countries where we broadcast to or where we now have operations through the web or even television. So it's great to have this panel and uh, uh, I have to say that I uh, wrote to all the panelists beforehand and uh, asked them to focus on uh, several topics uh, today. Primarily, the uh, authoritarian regimes recently uh, execute pressure on civic society, not only through jailing and directly harassing uh, the human rights activists, uh, but also through more elaborate measures. Uh, let's say through the measure of reg registration of uh, the organizations. Let's say that uh, in order to register an organization, you have to have 500 members, or let's say 1,000 members, or pick up the number that you want, but let's stick with 500 members for the organization, and then you are registered. And this is an example of how Kazakhstan Kazakh government is fighting with the uh, civic society in the country. Or let's say you cut the, uh, the funding, the foreign funding, and uh, the civic society doesn't have means to exist. And this is uh, not only a Russian example, but Russian recently. So there are a lot of new forms in which the authoritarian governments uh, are putting pressure uh, on this a segment of the society which is vital for uh, the development of the uh, countries. Uh, last year, the International Observatory for the Protection of Human Rights Defenders uh, focused on the uh, specific uh, tool that the government used to put pressure on human rights defenders, and this is uh, cutting the access to uh, funding. 
Uh, they published a report on this, and it turned out that it's not only in our area of uh, Eurasia uh, or, or Russia uh, or Iran or Cuba that the government is uh, cutting funds for NGOs, but also in countries like Venezuela and a lot of countries of Africa and Ethiopia, uh, practically all around uh, the world. And in the foreword uh, to this uh, report published by the observatory, uh, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Freedom of Peaceful Assembly and Association, uh, Maina uh, Kiai, wrote, we have witnessed increased stigmatization and undue restrictions in relation to access to funding and resources for civil society organizations in an attempt to stifle any reforms or criticism, especially calls for democratic change or accountability for human rights violations. And later, I'm particularly dismayed about laws or policies stigmatizing recipients due to their sources of funding, which have been adopted in the past months or under consideration in several countries across the world. Strangely enough, last week, exactly the same words, word by word, were heard at the General Assembly of the United Nations in New York, and those words were said by uh, President Obama. So I asked the panelists here to focus on three major topics. First, what are the new tools, measures, uh, tricks that the government are creating in order to put pressure on, on civil society in their countries? What does it mean to fight this? How do you, you know, continue your work under such a pressure? And the third topic is... Uh, I know that the next, the next panel will be uh, focusing on uh, you know, European institutions' mechanisms to put pressure on the certain governments, but uh, I asked panelists here to come forward with quick recommendation to make a bridge between this panel and uh, the next. Today uh, is the day when that come, kind of comes in light of Belarus, and that we spend under a symbol of Alice Belatsky. Uh, so I ask Tamara Matskevich to be the first panelist today. Uh, she is the coordinator of independent national program Teacher School Society. She edits the Nastavnik Info web portal and um, she is the deputy chair of uh, Belarusian School Society. Mm -hmm. Tamara, floor is yours. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Rina. Thank you all. It is a big honor for me uh, to take place here, to participate in this uh, conference. And I'd like to say some words about uh, Belarusian NGOs, but not only Belarusian, and, but um, not only uh, about NGOs. Regime of Belarus tries to cover its authoritarian nature with the um, Mm, with an imitation of uh, democracy. In addition of imitation of elections and three branches of power, we see imitation of market economy, laws, uh, imitation of opposition, third sector organizations, and free mass media. If we let uh, this, prox uh, this process go on, soon there will be imitation of human rights organization. Uh, organizations. There is nothing new about it. All the structures are created by the regime and uh, named the way those structures should be named in democratic countries. Uh, so people and organizations inside or outside Belarus who have only pragmatic, in uh, pragmatic interests find a way to justify their contacts with the pseudo structures in Belarus. The modern authoritarian regimes, instead of total control, practice managed political discourse that uh, has no visible dictate. The control is achieved through control of private business, selective suppression or reshaping of, use, of news and information, uh, non-free education as a tool for the tainting ne next generations. 
uh, all these innova uh, innovative uh, methods of democracy and human rights suppression uh, give their results. I would like to note how they influence Belarusian civil society organizations. Firstly, its brand discredit. We see how one strong and well-known democratic organization and political structures go smaller, lose intellectuals, split into parts, by they are un um, purposely not liquidated by the authorities in order to demonstrate the society their weakness and inability. At the same time, such uh, facade democracy is demonstrated uh, to the international community. Secondly, it is removal and discrediting of outstanding personalities and leaders. The brightest example is political prisoners. Seven candidates uh, for the president uh, uh, were imprisoned in the day of the last presidential elections. Uh, at the same time, several institutions of democratic countries continued to collaborate with Belarusian state uh, structures and provided them with the information necessary for setting up a criminal case against Alis Bilatsky. Of course, not for human rights activity. Political opponents of the regime turn into uh, hooligans and criminals according to propaganda. Thirdly, uh, many independ independent mass media turns into tabloids, repulsing the elite and uh, um, distracting the democratic electorate from the important topics. Fourthly, creation of pseudo-democratic structures of civil society. 111 uh, new civil organizations were registered in, by Ministry of Justice in uh, 2012. More than a half of them have a sports focus. So, so called, uh, we have uh, hobby uh, NGOs and Gongo and Bongo. No human right. No human run uh, NGOs were registered. Any independent activity is considered to be destructive. The NGOs are pushed to underground activity. So it is uh, not only human rights organizations who deal with repressions, but also, also cultural, ecological, educational NGOs, and so on. For example, the Association of uh, Writers, our head journal, Art Sadiba. Um, the another point, internet and social networks, free forums of independent mass media have become the arenas for propaganda and uh, place to blow off steam in virtual, in virtual uh, surrounding. As a result, uh, the social and protest activity of the people is reduced. And the last uh, point, uh, the purposeful destruction uh, of the nation, national identity, language, culture, tradition. The present government is not interested in Belarusian to realize their national roots uh, and uh, to restore traditional values, which is a part of the all European history and values. Um, democracy is our historical choice. The regime replaced these values with the homo uh, identity. What we expect from international, uh, international community? First of all, we expect from international society understanding that the regime cannot be modernized in Belarus. We expect solidarity uh, in this. In this situation, I'm not I'm not a big uh, optimist that European institutions in uh, the nearest uh, future will turn into values not f only to pragmatic interests. In this situation, we, I mean Belarusian NGOs, we uh, do uh, what we have to do, what we believe in. 
Олесь Беляцкий believe in uh, human rights values. Because of this, I think we uh, have to fight not only for, uh, for Les to release from jail, but uh, f for full rehabilitation of, of Les and all political prisons, prisoners. Um, I believe in civil education. We educate teachers, youth in critical thinking, uh, civil competences. Educated Belarusian people will be able to separ separate information from propaganda and find the way uh, of problem solving. I know that we have a result. Civil society in my country gradually uh, becomes stronger and stronger. Because of this, Lukashenko can take any chance to build such good facade of democracy as other neighbor countries. Belarusians will soon complete construction uh, of the building. Mm, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tamara. Uh, I think that the key word here is a facade democracy uh, that she used, and uh, uh, we will talk about facade democracy when we come to Azerbaijan a bit later, uh, because, yes, all those governments uh, need to maintain ties with the West, uh, need European institutions to develop, uh, to modernize uh, the economy, and uh, this is why, yes, they are trying to uh, preserve a semblance of, uh, uh, of democracies. Uh, one of the means how they do it is through using or misusing uh, the law. And uh, it serves dual purposes when they try to implement the law. Uh, first of all, they deal with the NGOs, with civil society, uh, with those whom they consider their enemies. And second, through the law, uh, they marginalized the civil, society, the civil society. And such was the law in Russia on uh, so-called foreign agents. Uh, I will ask Alexander Verkhovsky to uh, present uh, the case. Alexander is the head of Sava Center that is uh, conducting monitoring on ultra-nationalism activities, uh, crime, hate, and hate speech in Russia. And uh, the center was uh, a subject of... Uh, what the Russian government says calls inspections and what in reality we call raids against the uh, civic society organizations. Alexander, please. Uh, thank you, Irina. Uh, so I, I have a chance not to talk about ultranationalism and such things. I just uh, may recommend you to take such books there. They will show you what happens in this sphere in Russia. Uh, here I will talk about this crackdown of, of civil society. Uh, it's paradoxical that we have to talk about that after uh, unprecedented rise of civil protests against uh, election falsifications and following rise of political opposition. But of course, uh, of course, Mr. Putin, when he returned uh, to his presidential seat, he took some countermeasures. And one of these countermeasures was this men above mentioned law of, on foreign agents. Uh, there is a lot to talk about it, but uh, I will try to be short. The, the key idea of uh, such a legislation, as many other laws, uh, contemporary laws in Russia, is to create some uh, very vague uh, instrument which may be easily used uh, on political purposes. Uh, at least it was an initial idea, as I, as I understand. The, political, uh, the foreign agent by this law is, a, is an NGO who, which receives foreign funding and is involved in political activity, which is defined uh, like several points, including influencing public opinion with the purpose of changing uh, governmental policies, which means everything uh, in practice. Uh, so uh, law enforcement bodies uh, may find for foreign agents everywhere. There are many, some funny examples about that, but in general it's not funny at all. Uh, prosecutor offices uh, took the possibility to implement uh, this law and they organized a huge campaign of inspections uh, using also some uh, other legal means, so they inspected more than 2,000 
organizations, including those who could not be foreign agents by law. Uh, but anyway, uh, taking it short, the result was rather strange. Uh, no one NGO registered as a foreign agent because the law uh, anyway gives an NGO initiative to, be, to register itself. It cannot be uh, registered by authorities. Uh, some NGOs were punished for not registering. Uh, four of them uh, had to pay big fines and two of these four were suspended. Uh, many NGOs are still in courts uh, appealing against uh, orders to register or warnings uh, for supposed, the supposed uh, um, obligation to register maybe in the future. Some of them won these courts. Uh, but anyway, the list of foreign agencies is still empty. Only one Gongo registered. Uh, so it's a failure, uh, generally speaking. But uh, the pressure is here, and uh, of course, uh, it doesn't make our life easier. Uh, Eden asks how we uh, continue <laughs> our work in this situation. Uh, of course, different NGOs have maybe different tactics, but the strategy is all the same. First is to boycott the law, and second is to continue our work uh, if it is possible. Uh, since now it is possible. Uh, what is important about this law, it's uh, that's implemented purely politically. Uh, it was, uh, it came in force in November, then didn't implement for several months, then President Putin, not president at that moment, uh, oh, president, yes, right, sorry, he was president. <laughs> yeah, always, uh, yes, Does it so matter? Lost about it. Um, <laughs> he, he said that uh, why it's not implemented at all, uh, and immediately inspections uh, started. Then several months later, he said that maybe it's problematic, so we have, have maybe to amend the law, and in, immediately the campaign was more or less suspended, uh, mostly suspended. And, but amendments are not here yet. They are not sent to the State Duma, to the Parliament, so we don't know what real amendments will be and when. Uh, and it's not the only tool. For example, we have another law, so-called Dimo Yakovlev law, which is about orphans, maybe you know. But there also contains a clause on uh, NGOs related to American funding, not foreign funding. If NGO receives American money and uh, is involved in the same political activity, it has to be suspended uh, immediately without any preliminary procedures. This law is enforced since since the beginning of the year and was never implemented. So it's like Damocles' sword, which is here, but we don't know when will it work. Uh, there is uh, a big issue with anti-extremism legislation in our country. It mostly affects some <coughs> religious groups, but also NGOs. Uh, maybe the most known example is uh, Pussy Riot case. They are in prison uh, in the framework of this anti-extremism legislation. Uh, and it's not the only example, of course. So in just last month, uh, one uh, man in Arhangelsk city was sentenced uh, completely improperly uh, for supposed incitement, hatred. Uh, he's just an activist of Pamori sub-ethnic group. Uh, we have also several other potential threats which were created during last half a year, uh, year and a half, but uh, are not enforced. Uh, they changed uh, article in criminal code on high treason. Uh, high treason is a crime, obviously, but uh, initially it was the idea of person who support, I know, supports some foreign state uh, in its work against external security of Russian Federation. Now it's also made <clears throat> includes supports, for example, international organization, which may be UN, I don't know, Al-Qaeda or UN, whatever. Uh, and uh, the term external was excluded, so it's about any uh, security. What kind of any security it could be? Ecological security, I don't know. We have in our country such a strange term, not legal, but uh, rather widespread as spiritual security. Uh, so uh, we may expect something, but still, again, it doesn't work. Uh, libel was decriminalized during Medvedev's uh, rule, but it was recriminalized then, just half a year later. 
So uh, generally, uh, uh, we're expecting more problems, but problems are not so serious as we expected uh, a year ago. Uh, there may be different reasons why it's happened, so uh, I would mention only three. Uh, first is pure political, that uh, the level of oppositional activity is not as high as it was before, so maybe authorities are not worrying so much. Uh, second, uh, Olympics Games are coming, uh, and with obvious consequences. But third is more to our law enforcement system uh, that uh, practice shows that every new law, especially if it's vaguely formulated, uh, usually is starting implemented several months or sometimes even years later because law enforcement people uh, try to, uh, to keep law and nobody wants to, to be first in implementing that to avoid a lot of critics. Uh, so uh, what could we expect from our friends? Uh, <laughs> I, my colleague Natalia Tauben will talk about it in the next session. I, I would say only one, that even uh, if problems in Russia now are not so serious as we expected, as I say, but they are still here, and uh, those who are friends of, uh, who are interested in freedom and human rights in Russia have not to relax. And uh, just to show its solidarity, keeping an eye on what's happening in our country. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, one thing that Alexander just mentioned, Olympic Games coming to Russia that might be the factor why Russian authorities are not implementing their own plans to crack down on uh, civil society uh, that looked so dire a year ago. Azerbaijan uh, is a different uh, example of this facade uh, <coughs> democracy. Uh, the country of oil and caviar uh, is known in the world right now through the CNN. You probably all saw this fantastic promotion, country identity promo uh, on CNN with a breathtaking lady uh, inviting everybody to visit Azerbaijan. Well, this breathtaking, beautiful lady is the daughter of President Aliyev. Uh, this says a lot about the country. And um, Rasul Jafarov uh, spent recent years trying to exploit uh, those weak areas of Azerbaijani government, when they tried to create the facade, when they tried to keep a very good face, uh, like, for example, hosting the Eurovision uh, contest in uh, 2012, and uh, Rasul, a founder and uh, chairman of the Human Rights Club, uh, invented a movement which is called Sing for Democracy. Yeah. Uh, that then that later actually transferred this into the movement Art for uh, Democracy. Rasul, uh, it's kind of logical to ask what else do you plan to uh, exploit in order to influence the government? Uh, thank you very much and, uh, uh, and thank you for the question. By the way, we will also have European Olympic Games, first European Olympic Games in 2015. Uh, so we are planning to use this opportunity also to uh, bring the attention to the human rights situation in Azerbaijan. But before that, we have Azerbaijan chairmanship in Council of Europe uh, from the May of the next year uh, in the Committee of Ministers, and there is a concrete uh, obligations and commitments of Azerbaijan when Azerbaijan uh, became a member of, of the Council of Europe. By the way, uh, I have also materials here and I will put to the table, it's about the implementation of the Azerbaijan's commitments. Uh, and this is uh, like quite a uh, comprehensive report about the situation and uh, just not to lose the time about how the real situation right now, so I will put it to the table. Uh, then we will have uh, elections, two elections after the 9 October elections, which is next week. 
that one of this will be in December of 2014, it's a local elections, and then 2015 parliamentary elections. For us, uh, all such kind of things are very important uh, to be more active uh, than the other periods of time, which, which is actually uh, is mistake. Uh, we are always uh, trying to explain to our uh, colleagues, to uh, young activists mainly, that they shouldn't uh, focus on the human rights situation only when it's the eve of uh, elections or it's the eve of any, uh, any other event. Uh, of course, the attention will be double, but uh, besides of this, uh, like periods, we also have to uh, use our chances to raise the awareness, to be active, and to uh, support the human rights in Azerbaijan. Uh, just a couple of a couple hours ago, um, uh, Mehman Husseinov, who is young activist and photo blogger. Uh, arrested because of his uh, video uh, which he made uh, uh, from the voices of the presidential candidates and the message of this video is that Ilham Aliyev should leave his position in the end of the 9th of October election. Uh, and he's right now uh, in the prosecutor office uh, uh, and we expect that he, he will send to the jail at least for the two months as a pre-trial uh, detention uh, measure. Um, so actually this example proves how the uh, situation in the country uh, when the uh, government trying to uh, put a pressure on uh, like any, any critical voices. There's no matter you can be human rights defender, you can be a blogger, you can be a politician, you can be uh, just activists without any uh, affiliation, but if you are criticizing the government and if you are criticizing their uh, policy, you can be very easily targeted. So, uh, like answering to your question, uh, Irina, uh, the events, uh, as we mentioned, it's uh, also very important, but at the same time we have to focus on the human rights situation besides of this uh, events and we are we are doing our best in that way. Uh, like I listen to my colleagues, and we know the situation in other countries. So basically, what applies for Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, others, uh, it also applies uh, uh, in Azerbaijan. Like uh, problems with registration, problems with uh, funding, uh, problems with uh, like uh, implementation of the activities without pressure because it's like not possible uh, at all. Uh, so uh, our position is that uh, we uh, also have just continue. I mean, it's a good question that how we are uh, able to continue, but uh, we sometimes just don't think about it. We are just doing the uh, the work what we did before in a daily basis and we are just don't think what can happen tomorrow, what can happen after a couple of hours. However, we know that something uh, dangerous or something bad can happen. And uh, I think we also have to be uh, optimists, we have to be uh, uh, positive uh, and uh, just continue because Simply, we just don't have other option. Uh, now we are even joking sometimes that maybe tomorrow some of us will be arrested and finally we will have a chance to rest and read books in the prison. So I think we have to have such kind of uh, uh, like uh, attitude to the to the situation in the countries, and maybe in the end of uh, activities we will have uh, su ex uh, success. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, Rasul, I personally hope that you will not join the group of 142 political prisoners that are currently in uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, I divided this panel in, in kind of two groups, and this is the group of practitioners that you just uh, heard, but uh, uh, there are two other panelists who 
uh, apparently live and uh, work in the countries that uh, moved further, much further than uh, the former Soviet Union that uh, uh, considered to be, uh, you know, established democracies uh, right now. And uh, we talked with Adam yesterday and uh, I made a point that I, I, I have a feeling that uh, uh, in the former Soviet camp or bloc, uh, those countries were successful, like Poland, for example, who went through lustration uh, so that the mentality of the secret services of the Soviet uh, times uh, does not interfere anymore in the development of the society and in the development of civic society as a, a very important uh, a factor of growth uh, and forming of public consciousness. Uh, nonetheless, uh, Adam, uh, Adam recently participated in a very interesting roundtable, as he uh, wrote me. The roundtable was organized by the Commissioner for Human Rights of the Council of uh, Europe. And Adam, let's start with the, this experience that uh, you had recently. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. I, I'm really honored, and especially because, as you just said, uh, being from Poland and dealing with human rights, you do not risk that after coming back from such a conference, something will happen to you. And this is really... Uh, and I always have this, this strange feeling when, when being at, at such conferences that, uh, that on the one hand, I, I know that such organization as mine, Helsinki Foundation for Human Rights, is needed, but on the other hand, I have this feeling that, that my work is so secure and, uh, in fact, so nice. Uh, in, in this in this respect as compared to, to, to Russell or, or other persons who, who spoke before. Uh, I would like to, uh, as, you, as Irina said, uh, Commissioner for Human Rights um, of Council of Euro Europe, uh, Nish Muznikus, organized this year a um, uh, roundtable discussion with human rights defenders from uh, uh, Eastern countries uh, to discuss relationship between human rights and the operation of secret services. And uh, uh, he claims, and our discussion proved, that we have a substantial problem here, which was uh, for many years neglected. So states uh, which were under the transformation were asked to, um, uh, or were under certain pressure to pass certain laws uh, that would reform secret services, but ultimately there is no significant change. So even if we discuss such uh, issues like foreign agents law, uh, even if we discuss some specific measures which are aimed to curtail uh, NGOs' operations, we should still uh, think uh, in such terms that there are almost uncontrolled uh, secret services in all those countries which have uh, huge powers to interfere into citizens' life, which have huge powers in order to interfere into the operation of human rights defenders as well as um, uh, NGOs. Um, and of course, uh, this interference, uh, I think, is, is not, no secret to, to anybody, is uh, wiretapping, is blackmailing, is, uh, is creating some false cases against uh, human rights defenders. So I think that if you would select each and every state, we can uh, find uh, plenty of uh, examples concerning this. And there is a hope that, uh, uh, that the international community will take this uh, issue on the agenda and will start to talk about it. So what really is a consequence of living in those states uh, uncontrolled uh, uh, secret services and especially this feeling of impu impunity. So the uh, secret services officers, if they do something, they, they know that they have uh, support from the political power. They know that their criminal activity will go uh, unpunished. Uh, moreover, even if there is a legislation which aims to control somehow secret services, usually it is not, um, it is not applicable uh, or the, pra the actual practice is completely uh, different. I would just give you an example. Yesterday I had a meeting with the Polish Minister of Justice and we talked about the introduction in Poland of a new law that would uh, regulate the operational control of secret services. And he said that one of experts told him that, you know, in Russia they have a really perfect law. On paper it looks just ideally. 
uh, like like for, for a democratic state. But 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 the question is that of course nobody will try to import the law from uh, Russia in a situation which it uh, which the practice is just completely completely different. But I would like to to turn our attention to um, another aspect of, of this problem, because. Uh, uh, when we talk about uh, secret services and potential control over secret, uh, secret services, we should also look at our own practices. What we can see is that because of the war on terror and um, in Western states, we adopted different kinds of legislation that interfere with our freedoms, that uh, put uh, huge emphasis on the national uh, security or public order, but at the same time restricts our freedoms. But please note that by this fact, we gave like additional argument for authoritarian states that they should also have all those, uh, all those measures, that they should also use those measures because if they are applicable so nicely in the Western states, why shouldn't we uh, apply them in Eastern states? But, but this, uh, but such approach gives uh, additional um, argument uh, for uh, repressive uh, regimes, repressive governments, just to use easily without any criticism from the Western states such, such measures. So, so I think that we should think uh, a little bit about uh, also our, I would say, Western uh, blame. And I would like to move uh, a little bit also to, uh, to talk about uh, um, this Václav Havel legacy, in fact, in this, in this context. Because when, when I, uh, being in, in my organization, we try from time to time involve Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the European Union uh, into certain actions concerning uh, uh, human rights defenders in the, uh, in the East. The problem is that, first of all, I would name it as a principle of selectivity. So uh, sometimes, governments interfere when, when it is comfortable to intervene, when it does not create any specific uh, uh, like problem from the point of view of economy, but sometimes not. And the Eastern Partnership is a, EU Eastern Partnership is a very good example. So with respect to Belarus, with respect to uh, Georgia, Moldova, Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs has really great, maybe not great, but some policies uh, uh, relating to human rights. But, but when it comes to Azerbaijan, it's almost impossible to get any specific statement uh, regarding uh, Azerbaijan, any criticism from the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So if I would compare different Central and, uh, East, uh, and Eastern European countries, and, if, and especially if I would compare the policy of Poland and the Czech Republic, I think the Czech Republic still tries to, to, to put emphasis on values, on human rights protection, as it should be read in the, in the international context. Another problem uh, is that, uh, of course, there are different international human rights remedies that are aimed to counteract human rights uh, violations. Uh, the problem is that uh, Eastern states, uh, especially those belonging to the Council of Europe, have learned how to deal with those remedies, how to react to them in order not to do, in fact, anything special or just to delay any, uh, any implementation. At the same time, we have a problem with accessibility of those international remedies. Let's mention the foreign agents law. Foreign agents law was uh, submitted, uh, or the, the case concerning foreign agents law was submitted to the European Court of Human Rights long time ago. Uh, maybe not long time ago, but I would say in a sufficient period in order to communicate this case uh, to the government of Russia. But still, the European Court of Human Rights didn't react yet. We are waiting for the communication because it would be also the opportunity for other NGOs to join proceedings to submit their interventions, amicus courier, uh, courier briefs. But even if the case is, is made, uh, even if the judgment is passed in this or the other case, then we would have a problem with enforcement of judgments. There are hundreds of cases which are not enforced, which uh, didn't create any significant, uh, significant change. Uh, we have cases in which uh, repressive governments just openly refuse to abide with the, uh, with the judgment. And of course, after a certain period of time, you can expect some uh, diplomatic pressure to, to, to implement, but, uh, but on a given day, uh, they do not produce a, a real change. So I think that uh, the civil society crisis 
it's not just a question of the policies in this or the other state, but it is also a problem of the Western states which uh, forgotten uh, certain values like human rights, like democracy, and I would like to mention here solidarity as a major common component of our uh, actions towards the East. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam, and that's a fantastic link to our next uh, speaker, uh, Pavel Damesh, uh, who played a key role in the EU civil society development program and uh, actually helped democratization efforts in the Balkans and in Eastern partnership uh, of uh, European Union. Uh, let me speak not only about the European Union as it is, but also about the, of course, Council on, uh, of Europe. Uh, in 2007, the Council of uh, Europe, the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe, adopted a recommendation which established a framework of the legal status of NGO in the region. 2007, six years later, this is what we hear. So your comment on the development, mm -hmm. please. Thanks very much. Uh, also, I would like to uh, open my statement by congratulating uh, Alice Bialatsky, whom I know personally quite well. And uh, it couldn't be more appropriate that Václav Havel, whom I knew also very well, uh, that his uh, prize named after him is given uh, to Belarusian uh, civic activist because Václav Havel, just before he passed away, he wrote letter of support to activists uh, in country of concern. Belarus was on his mind uh, constantly. Uh, but since we are celebrating uh, Alice Bialatsky, I think that we need to remind ourselves that he got to prison uh, also due to some mistakes done by us, not only by his work uh, you know, on behalf of Yasna and protecting human rights. And I think it would be quite useful if in upcoming Eastern Partnership Summit, uh, if uh, Foreign Minister of Belarus, uh, Mr. Make, is invited, he should get copy of this award in his invitation package, since his citizen was awarded this uh, special prize. Let me now... Uh, just frame a little bit the issue of civil society NGOs in Europe uh, a little bit broader and then merge into this trend when civil society organizations, human rights in particular, uh, are attacked or are having problems. Uh, next year, we are celebrating 25th anniversary of fall of Berlin Wall Velvet Revolution and all of these changes which occurred in Europe. So it will be already a quarter century. In these 25, now 24, next year, 25 years, there was enormous emergence of civil society organizations of all kinds across whole our region. It was part of overall transition, democratization, and we were very optimistic that our countries will just go from this post-totalitarian situation to more and more democratic, some faster, some little bit slower. But none of us 25 years ago expected that NGOs will be part of harassment and all kinds of problems, issues what we were hearing from our colleagues at this panel, but also on panel uh, which was before this one. There is no doubt that NGOs contributed tremendously to changing political culture throughout whole region. They brought trend of civic activism, civic participation. Uh, citizens through NGOs have chance now to look at how government is performing. Through NGOs, citizens can look at how power holders, either political or economic, are conducting their work NGOs are linking their countries with others and are developing international networks. If we look where are we now today in Europe, we have countries falling into three categories. 
ones which are already members of European Union. These are 11 countries, three Baltic, Visegrad, four, and four from Southern Europe, Slovenia, Croatia, Bulgaria, Romania. So altogether, 11 countries basically met basic or general standards for human rights where NGOs can per perform relatively well. Then we have second group of countries which are labeled Eastern Partnership, six countries in between European Union and Russia. And those countries do not have clear membership perspective in European Union as those who already made it to EU or some other Western Balkan countries which still have promise and what they do is still according conditionality given by European Union. And third is country called Russia, which is playing very different role than years back, which is having more and more influence across the region, not only in near neighborhood, but also in our countries where Russia is playing quite important role, which we can discuss later. I think that if we look at how NGOs perform in these various situations, one would expect that once you join European Union, NGOs' human rights are okay, nothing bad can happen to them. Well, even this is not true. If you look at countries like Bulgaria today, where people are protesting for months already against misgivings of government, if you look at Hungary, where civic activists are complaining about restriction of their freedoms, so even if you join European Union, it's not automatically guaranteeing that civil society and human rights are okay. If you look at Eastern Partnership countries, again, it is not homogeneous group of countries. You have range from oppressive nature against NGOs and human rights. Surely champion is Belarus. Belarus is the only country which is not even member of Council of Europe, the only country which was kicked out on the basis of violation of human rights by the government of that country. And Moldova is doing relatively fine, and other countries in between. Azerbaijan was mentioned. There are countries which have political prisoners, and Alex Bialatsky is one of them. What governments in these countries uh, have learned throughout 24 years is that NGOs are significant players which can influence their power. So what governments are doing, particularly in those countries which are not having membership perspective, they are using very different methodologies in our countries I remember in my homeland, Slovakia, during Vladimir Mečiar period when he tried to oppress NGOs and human rights, we had EU conditionality because we wanted to join EU. EU said you need to do this. You need to allow space for free civic initiatives. Government was pressed. In countries of Eastern Partnership, in Russia, European Union doesn't have too much power to press or similar way as it happened in those countries which already joined in. And there is an experience in these post-Soviet countries with color revolutions. When governments realized that NGOs can have profound role in looking at fingers of power holders, that NGOs and human rights activists have powerful tools to mobilize citizens, to monitor electoral process. So after a series of orange revolutions, particularly in Georgia and Ukraine, post-Soviet leaders learned the lesson. If you want to control citizens, you need to control NGOs. And there are five areas how this is happening. First are legal changes. They learned that if you create restrictive environment, legal environment, it resembles democratic process because government through parliament is creating legal space. So legal changes, alteration of legal norms. Second area is to develop parallel NGOs or pro-governmental NGOs. Tamara mentioned this as well. 
that those are neutralizing activities of those NGOs which want to tell the truth about ruling elites. Third area is scandalizing, harassing, and imprisonment of human rights activists. Fourth is attacking Western donors, and in most extreme case, is just kicking them out, either directly or through some direct, indirect region. And I think that here, again, Belarus is the best place to look at when it is Western donors had to leave completely. Even OSCE, which was monitoring elections, was kicked out because Lukashenko doesn't like this. And Russian situation and other post-Soviet countries are showing this example that kicking out Western donors from territory of the country, closing their offices and so on is effective tool. And fifth area is attacking Western governments international institutions for interfering into domestic affairs. This is classical period by any neo-authoritarian regimes, rulers, non-interference into domestic affairs. This is mantra which they use and then they, within this category, they use bargaining then based on some economic and other interests they bargain with little bit space for one or another organization if they sort of are helping the government. And the most brutal thing is bargaining with prisoners, with other governments. And I think that this is something what very often is happening and country of concern, Belarus is the best. Lukashenko is master in bargaining with prisoners he is always getting something if he releases one or two, so they are political prisoners, human rights activists are for him, matter for sale. What can EU do under these circumstances or in this period? First, I think that even if it is difficult for us, we have to admit that we have internal problems with ourselves, which are unrelated to authoritarian regimes. EU is in trouble. EU is no more so consistent and powerful union as it used to be. If you are Greek or if you are Spaniard, you have, or if we are having a lot of conferences now and meetings how to just maintain European Union, Eurozone and so on, so European Union is not so powerful as it used to be. And also, in a way, we have democratic deficit in many countries, including my own or including Czech Republic, Václav Havel, who was my president as well, I think wouldn't be terribly happy watching some political practices in Czech Republic or Slovakia. Secondly, I think that we need to be very strict and don't compromise with human rights, which can't be altered, speculated on, Basic human rights, as are in Charter of UN, I think is something what we shouldn't start relativizing, and we need to be tougher with that. And also, whenever some country, be it EU member state or EU neighbor, I think that we need to develop some kind of conditionality when human rights, human rights activists are suffering what and how we are. We need to be just simply tougher. Third, we need to develop narrative for those countries which do not have EU membership perspective, where we, in foreseeable future, we can't even imagine that they are going to join, but we need to guarantee that in these countries we have some say and methods how to help them to maintain human rights. And fourth, which goes with this, is to develop new instruments and which are non-bureaucratic and flexible. And here, European Endowment for Democracy, which was recently created, is one of such attempts when EU governments, EU institutions came to realization that we need to be more flexible if we want to be helpful for, to those people, institutions, NGOs, which are trying to develop human rights in their homelands. And last but not least is we need to develop closer cooperation with the United States and their institutions, public and private,
to press more multilateral organizations like UN and OSCE, where many of these countries are members, when they signed numerous documents where human rights are part of it. And since Council of Europe gave prize to Alice Bialatsky, I think that it is just good that Council of Europe as an organization where all of concerned European countries, whether they are EU members, non-members, also Russia is in it. I think that Václav Havel's name connected with price given by Council of Europe is powerful tool to press for non-compromised steps towards human rights and I'm very happy that Ales and Bialatsky and his name is now on connected with Václav Havel Award and through that with consciousness of Council of Europe. Thank you very much. Dr. Demish, thank you very much for this uh, fantastic, brilliant overview of the problems that uh, uh, this part of the world and uh, further eastern part of the world is facing. Uh, let me open the floor for comments to the panelists. Does anybody have any comment on what you heard here? No? Let me open the floor to, to questions, please. Okay, <laughs> since, <laughs> since everybody is, uh, looks like, making the mind. Oh, I have a question, yes, if, if it is possible. Uh, I'm on the back, you, you can't see me. Uh, oh, I can, we can. So. So. <clears throat> my, na my name is I Igor Blažević, and uh, I will ask the question for, for, for Pavel, if you can just elaborate a little bit about uh, what you mean by the more flexible uh, mechanisms, let's say, how they are looking like, how they should look like, and what has been already achieved to have them more uh, flexible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Igor. I think that uh, one of the issues is that when many programs after fall of Berlin Wall started to develop, people thought that NGOs and human rights activists will be operating in an environment where European institutions just can give them financial support through regular, well-established mechanisms in open and transparent manner. But we see situation that giving openly and in transparent way how it is done in Europe or how it is done for sort of charitable organizations or non-human right, those which are, I call them non-radioactive, which are not interfering into governmental affairs, that simply governments in these countries found a way and created barriers for supporting these organizations. Secondly, many Western donors can give support to registered organizations which have legal identity, and in many cases human rights defenders are losing legal identity and many donors cannot give them this. Or time and how you give. So altogether this new instrument, European Endowment for Democracy, which was just established during summer months, announced that it is up and running and first grant applications are coming and are being awarded. Uh, it can support in first phase mostly organizations in eastern neighborhood of EU and southern northern Africa, MENA region. And flexibility means that award that EED can give award not only to registered but also to non-registered. It can support also individuals who are fighting for causes of human rights. And these are and also timing, it is on ongoing basis. These are not like every quarter of year and so on. Uh, people can apply it continuously and once the project is evaluated, it is a matter of weeks within which they can get support. So for European Union, it is very unusual because many other instruments and uh, procedures which are 
supporting similar causes, NGOs, by other EU instruments are having all kinds of stipulations and are also under heavy political pressure. So this is semi-independent entity which is developing pra practices of grant making through practices of others who are flexible and proven like uh, several European and American foundations. Uh, okay, that's great that uh, Europe, Europe invented an institution that will bypass the normal bureaucratic practices of uh, spreading the funds uh, through uh, the area of Eurasia and uh, Eastern Europe. But can this money be accepted by, by, uh, by, the country, uh, by, by NGOs in Russia or in Azerbaijan or in Belarus? You know... Uh, and this is a question to Alexander. And, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think it depends on organization, of course, uh, or, or, or person, if, if you can yeah. give to, to persons. Uh, uh, foreign agents law uh, cannot be applied to non-registered groups and persons, so it's easier. But anyway, uh, we, we cannot, uh, we in general, as a, uh, NGOs in Russia, we cannot just decline to take foreign funding because it, it's impossible to continue without it. Uh, uh, there is a growing uh, governmental funding for NGO work in Russia and even, I mean, pro proper true NGO can uh, get these so-called presidential grants. But in, in a way, we cannot, be, cannot depend on this one, one source, even if we all can receive such grants. It's, it's impossible in such a country as Russia. Maybe in Germany, NGOs can rely only on governmental sources, N not in Russia, of course. So anyway, we, we have to, to, to fight for possibility to, to leave this foreign funding. Adam had a comment? Uh, I have a question to Mr. Demesh. Uh, regarding those uh, five points, uh, what should be, what the EU may do. Um, and I have a question concerning the relationship with the United States. Because I, I, uh, I agree that the U.S. Is a, is a great partner in supporting different human rights and democracy uh, causes, and that I think most of us dream about coming back of this Jimmy Carter era and thinking about human rights in those terms. But at the same time, we have a problem with this uh, strict and not compromising approach to human rights with respect to the U.S., uh, yesterday, uh, Edward Snowden was shortlisted for the Saharov Prize. We have a number of targeted killings. We have a problem with lack of accountability for the whole CIA rendition process. So how to deal with this, with this controversy here? How to be strict on human rights and at the same time cooperate with the U.S. on those issues? Very good question, and I think that uh, US, when I mentioned that we need to look when we are discussing assisting in countries where NGOs and human rights are oppressed, that my first point was that first we need to look at ourselves because European Union is in trouble in economic United States yesterday, just 800,000 people didn't go to work. Uh, and also United States is not as strong as it used to be, and it is also, after 9-11, started to change many steps, both domestically and internationally, and credibility of the United States as human rights defending country is at stake. No doubt about that. I think that all measures which U.S. took after 9-11 are limiting numerous freedoms domestically and also uh, several steps internationally are annoying people in Europe and, and, and globally. So for that reason, I think that we are living in very turbulent times, also the West, which we need to admit, because once you want to tell somebody or have some measures or do something, you know, first you need to be credible. And I think that but the world is not black and white, and also if U.S. and European Union, even if we have our own internal problems, it is our duty to help others who are seeking assistance because you can't compare uh, 
sort of situation in European Union and in the United States from human rights or economic point of view with countries which we are discussing. Otherwise, we, we could get that nobody is perfect and just lay back or focus on yourself. But you are right in this that we need to indicate or notice that this credibility of U.S. is at stake. And, uh, but many, and I link it and, and we'll finish with your question, I think that there is a lot of experience. I'm dealing with Belarus for over a decade. I mean, when it comes to assisting people in these countries like Belarus, Azerbaijan, Russia, and so on, first of all, we need to talk to people who are getting assistance, they will tell you directly whether they can receive it or not and how they should receive it. It's not up to us to figure it out and they will tell you whether this is dangerous, not dangerous, what kind of risk is behind and so on. So we need to minimize the risk of those which are assisted and, uh, and uh, people around this table, Tamara and uh, guys from Russia and, and Azerbaijan know very well and, uh, and Alexander mentioned that human rights organizations in these countries just simply couldn't survive without external assistance and we constantly need to upgrade our tools, methods uh, because this is, uh, this is just simply struggle but they are risking mostly uh, not us who are helping them but first of all we need to listen to them uh, if we want to be of help. Thank you. Any comments from the panel? Okay, we have five minutes left, and uh, yes, <laughs> we have a question here. It's coming. It's coming. Uh, you know, it's a Charter 77 Foundation. Uh, when listening to this very interesting and very deep discussions, I realized that it is now becoming more difficult to support people in some countries than it was 30 years ago within the communist regime. I had been, on behalf of the Charter 77 Foundation, sending money large amount of money to hundreds, maybe two hundreds individuals using the communist regime to the uh, um, scheme and never, sometimes they, during interrogation some people will say, we know that you are said, but never it came to the accusation, never to came to the court and so this legal uh, scheme of sending money from the West to the dissident in a communist country was, when I'm listening to you now, somewhat easier than uh, with these uh, countries which entered, uh, made uh, end with the Soviet regime and entered... Uh, a certain democratic development. You should be careful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yanov. One more question, the final one. Yes, please, in the center. Maybe uh, following Martin Paloš, uh, following up what has been said and following up what uh, uh, was contained in Pavel Demesh's five points. You mentioned as one of the most uh, frequently used arguments uh, non-intervention uh, to domestic matters uh, used by totalitarian or authoritarian governments. We very often hear another uh, two words in this context, double standards and selectivity, which means that it's easier uh, to uh, criticize internationally human rights violations in the countries that are not, I would say, as significant geostrategically as others. Obviously, China might stand up as a most warning uh, uh, example, Russia maybe too. Uh, do we have any strategy how to paralyze, eliminate, weaken the argument of double standards and selectivity? 
Okay, I may try and colleagues may add their take on that. I think that uh, if we would speak from strictly moral point of view, I think that we should be clear-cut, uncompromised, and surely human rights activists are about this. They are about truth, but in reality, if you look at today's world, I think that it's more complicated than it used to be two decades ago because we have emergence of new powers on whom we are dependent. 20 years ago, China wasn't economic giant, didn't play such a significant role. Today, United States can't be so strict on China and Chinese human rights as it used to be because uh, economic dependence or interdependence between the two all these BRICS countries, sort of Russia and others, are sort of growing in importance. So I think we need to take into consideration some hard facts. And surely Azerbaijan is more difficult to be criticized because of their oil and other wealth than, than Moldova. Uh, because, you know, we can live without Moldovan wine, but a little bit less without... Uh, um, Azari oil. So I think that my take on this is that those people who are dealing with human rights or those who are supporting them need to calculate as much as they can also some geopolitical realities and, and be smart. Not to compromise, give up, but take it into consideration. There are, we need to upgrade our skills, our narratives, once we are talking with governments, once we are talking or developing or helping to develop NGO infrastructure, and engaging more multilateral institutions within which these countries signed, you know, because otherwise it is then very easy to escape if there is one or two countries which is criticizing them or some selected group of donors who are supporting human rights causes. So I think that Besides supporting, giving practical support to human rights defenders, NGOs, I think we need to use this more sophisticated political approach, we engaging also multilateral organizations and don't let them overlook some of the misgivings of member states and their governments. Thank you, Dr. Damesh. I think uh, we ran out of time right now and I want to thank all the panel panelists for this fantastic discussion that we had here and we also, this panel came forward with one practical recommendations to the, uh, recommendation to the organizers of this uh, conference and uh, thank you Dr. Damesh again. The recommendation is please include the, uh, the copy of the award to Alice Bilatsky in the invitation package for the Belarus Foreign Minister to the EU Summit. Thank you.